we now begin a series of videos about the chemical bond. Uh, now, in prior videos, we actually have studied uh, the structure, the electronic structure of single atoms. And of course, what we're interested in now is seeing how single atoms come together to form chemical bonds uh, so that they can give rise to molecules, especially molecules that are interested in the life sciences. Right, so uh, again, it's for only from a deep knowledge of the electronic structure of individual atoms and then we can understand fully how uh, those atoms come together to form bonds and then generate molecules. In principle, there's three types of three main classes of chemical bonding, okay, that is metallic, ionic, and covalent. As it turns out, because our interest in the, is in the life sciences, the first two uh, classes, metallic and ionic, are not as important as covalent. Okay, so everything that we're going to be studying in the next few videos is related to the covalent bonding. Now, uh, the keyword for a uh, covalent bond is the idea that our electrons are shared between atoms. Okay, it's only that sharing of electrons uh, uh, that is important to the uh, to the covalent bond. And again, our emphasis is going to be solely placed on the covalent bond. Now, uh, ideally, what we'd like to do is set up the Schrodinger equation for any molecule, and then uh, solve that equation to figure out what the properties uh, of the bond are. Okay, and while this can be done, and this is actually the way that uh, it's done in research uh, uh, avenues, okay, uh, for the purpose of this course, we're actually going to uh, carry out a much more qualitative discussion in which we will not, we will not be solving explicitly the Schrodinger equation. We're simply going to see how we can understand uh, covalent bonding within the framework of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Okay? The first thing that we can do then is try to focus on the simplest molecule and see uh, what is it that we know about the bonding in that molecule. Okay, the simplest molecule that we can think of is H2, okay, which we can represent as this. Right. One of the things that we can attempt to do first is try to see how uh, uh, the bond between those hydrogen atoms is formed. And we can try to map that by drawing here something that is called a potential energy curve. Okay, so uh, what we can plot is how the potential energy, which we can call V, changes as a function of the separation between the two atoms. Okay, uh, so again, this uh, molecule is formed by the interaction of uh, one hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom. And from our quantum mechanics studies, we understand that uh, these atoms have one electron each, and those electrons uh, can be described with one as wave functions. Well, when those atoms are infinitely separated, okay, so we're in this uh, part of the diagram, there's actually no interaction between the two atoms, and that means that the energy of the interaction is zero, the potential energy is zero. Okay, so again, at the infinite separation, okay, we actually know that the energy is zero. But eventually what should happen is that uh, as the atoms come, to, uh, come closer together, uh, the electrons of, or the electron of one atom is going to be attracted by the proton of the other atom, and the electron of this atom is going to be attracted by the protons of this other atom, and those uh, interactions are stabilizing, which means that the energy will uh, drop. Okay, so again, at some distance, okay, uh, the nucleus of this atom can start to see the electron of that atom, and the nucleus of this atom can start to see the electron of this atom, and then that stabilizes uh, uh, that molecule. Okay, so what we actually observe is that the energy should drop. And the energy drops until uh, the atoms reach a distance in which um, the attraction, the cross attraction between the electrons uh, and the uh, nucleus is maximum, okay? And, and the molecule reaches the most stable geometry. This is where this point is, the energy becomes a minimum, and we call this the equilibrium distance for a molecule. Experimentally, this equilibrium distance for the H2 bond is about 0.74 Armstrong. Now we're going to continue to trace this potential energy curve by trying to uh, decrease even more the internuclear distance. Okay, so now we're actually uh, pushing the uh, hydrogen atoms closer uh, uh, than the equilibrium distance. And then what happens is that as we push this atom closer, what's going to happen is that the electrons start to be in a, in a region of space that is very close, um, and also the, the nuclei uh, start to actually overlap. And because uh, those electrons are negatively charged and the nuclei that are very close are positively charged, they will repel each other, there will be a lot of repulsion, and that, is, uh, that can be exemplified by a uh, rapid increase in the potential energy. Okay, so this is how a diatomic energy curve looks like. All right, so the question is, uh, how can we develop theories that can capture this experimental curve? Okay, an important aspect of this curve, for example, is the idea that uh, the dissociation energy 
of this bond, which is a measure of the bond energy, uh, is about 430, 32 kilojoules per mole, more or less, for the hydrogen ion, for the hydrogen molecule. Okay, so again, what, what we want to do is come up with uh, theories that can quantitatively describe both this bond strength, which we'll call the dissociation energy, and the equilibrium distance. Okay, and there's going to be two uh, classes of uh, uh, theories and the three disc covalent bond that we're going to be examining in the next videos. One of them is a long long theory, and the other one is going to be molecular orbital theory. Now, both of those theories uh, actually involve, firstly, an approximation that uh, is quite important. When you have an H2 molecule, what we actually know is that this H2 bond, these two, these two atoms, can actually move in space. That molecule is always vibrating. And that vibration is very fast. Okay, the period of vibration uh, uh, is in the uh, is very short, and, and this molecule usually undergoes vibrations, you know, several trillion times per second, right? So the nuclei are moving, but the electrons are also moving, right? So you have there a problem in which you have two types of motion: nuclear motion and then electronic motion. Well, the approximation is that uh, because the nuclei are approximately uh, 1,800 times heavier than the electrons then the electrons move much faster than the nuclei, okay? Or in other words, what we can actually assume is that uh, every time that the nuclei move, as in a vibration, okay, the electrons are going to move so fast that they will be adjusting their positions instantaneously to any deformation in the internuclear distance, okay? That is called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and permits the separability of the nuclear motion of this vibration, okay, and the electronic motion, which is what we're interested in. Right, so uh, when we actually calculate these curves with the theories, okay, the idea is that we can uh, essentially hold fix uh, the distance at any value that we want, the equilibrium distance, and then this distance, and then that distance, and then that distance. And then without moving the atoms, we can actually ask the question, well, uh, what is the electronic structure around that particular uh, fixed distance? Okay, if we can calculate then the energy at that particular uh, distance, we should be able to trace this diatomic energy curve. Uh, and again, that illustrates the usefulness of the born oppenheimer, oppenheimer approximation. Right, in the next few videos, we're going to start our survey of valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory, and we'll be able to explain uh, the covalent bonding in a variety of molecules.